you can start i think uh, yes sir okay sir so good evening one and all uh, thank you again for joining us in this uh, continuous medical education program uh, especially meant for post graduates uh, we do have a prominent uh, infective endocarditis specialist from the united states who has co-authored a chapter on infective endocarditis along with dr bazur uh, larry bazur in a, in the textbook of infectious diseases dr bharat raj uh, who who is working as an assistant professor in the mayo clinic rochester his clinical interest being um, infective endocarditis and device related infections i would like to invite the, our moderators dr sadanandam and dr ravi math who are working as an associate professor in ramachandra hospital porur and jayadeva hospital uh, bangalore uh, ravi math is not new to us uh, he already uh, had a, we have he was a moderator in one of our sessions uh, ravi math has published a significant amount of contribution in uh, Uh, on uh, infective endocarditis one of his uh, la- one of the largest experience of india is from all indian institute of medical sciences which was uh, where ravi math is the dr ravi math is the first author and uh, it is published in american heart journal we also have an, our uh, associate professor of cardiology from our department dr sadanandam who is also keenly in- interested towards managing patients with infective endocarditis over to dr ravi math dr sadanandam and dr bharat raj thank you all um good evening all uh, i'm dr ravi mart from uh, jaydeva and we have an interesting topic it's on infective endocarditis and uh, as we are all aware this the profile of infective endocarditis has changed considerably over the past 100 years i mean worldwide but in india and in a number of developing countries the situation is much more complex and uh, here we have because of a developing economy as well as a Uh, what i should say uh, uh, a very large uh, a pool of rheumatic heart disease we tend to see both the oscillarian ie and the modern infective endocarditis both side by, side by side and despite all advances we still have an in hospital mortality of almost 20% which goes up to 30% by 6 months and this is even much more for you know prosthetic valves and for the cardiac devices and to put uh, to give more and puts and to give his own uh, scenarios a side of the story uh, we have dr bharat it's a very tough subject and i'm sure he's going to do a lot of, uh, give us a lot of insight into it so over to dr bharat and dr Sad- uh, i mean uh, from my side here yeah i welcome dr bharat uh, actually we have heard a, a series of lecture from him when he was in uh, visited ramachandra definitely the audience are going to get a uh, big uh, academic blast from dr bharat we welcome you dr bharat you can start your uh, lectures okay uh, thank you everyone for inviting me to this virtual uh, lecture series uh, i'm delighted to join you all uh, this is it's like 6:30 in the morning uh, dr bhupati made me to wake up <laughs> uh, but i'm very very happy to be here with all of you Uh, so i will try to share my slides are you able to see my slides uh, not yet dr bharat okay what about now we can oh, we can see it i mean maybe you could make it full screen okay yeah that's perfect okay sounds good so uh thanks for joining us today um 
I work in the Division of Infectious Disease at Mayo Clinic. I am part of a cardiovascular infectious disease focus group. And um, um, most of my work has involved uh, mentors, Dr. Badur, Dr. Uh, Walt Wilson. Uh, they have done uh, like tremendous amount of work in the field of infectious endocarditis. Uh, they've uh, spent their entire uh, lifetime in studying infective endocarditis. And most of my knowledge uh, it comes from them. So special thanks to them. So I will start. I don't have any financial conflicts. So what we are going to do today is just to give a basics of infective endocarditis, look at the epidemiology. And uh, again, as Dr. Mark mentioned, the epidemiology in the Western developed countries is different from developing countries where rheumatic heart disease is more prevalent. Uh, we will talk briefly about changing trends in the pathogens that we see here in the US. Uh, pathogenesis of vegetation, prostate valve endocarditis. And if we have time, we will talk about uh, cardiac implantable electronic device infection. Um, if not, then we can do some other day. So infective endocarditis, um, it's a very rare but serious infection of the heart. Uh, it can involve the native valve or the prostatic valve it can be acute, rapidly damaging the heart valves, or it can be subacute, resulting in indolent uh, manifestations. Sorry, I picked the wrong slides. One second, let me get the updated slides. Sorry for that. All right, sorry. Uh, so I added um, a couple of slides last minute. Uh, Dr. Bhuvadi asked me to uh, talk a little bit about history. So, uh, so here are the slides. So uh, vegetation inside the heart have been described um, as early as 16th century, uh, but at the time, you know, uh, nobody knew what bacteria was. So the germ theory of infection uh, was not until the late, uh, you know, 18th and 19th century. So they didn't know what they were dealing with when they saw these vegetations inside the heart. Uh, Covisat in 1806 speculated that this could be due to syphilis. Uh, again, even at the time, they didn't know syphilis was caused by a bacteria, uh, but uh, syphilis as a clinical syndrome was well-defined. Uh, Dr. Bullard, defined what endothelium is, the covering of the heart, and what is inflammation. An interesting uh, tidbit for the cardiologist is the concept of embolism was uh, described by Kirks, and this was first described in patients with endocarditis. So um, before, uh, um, like uh, the concept of uh, clotting in cardiovascular disease, the concept of embolism was described in patients with endocarditis. Uh, Dr. Paget noted that this kind of clinical syndrome was more common in rheumatic heart disease. And Dr. Hoard uh, found that this was common among a bicuspidiotic valve disease. But the bulk of our um, like uh, knowledge about infective endocarditis, the way we know it started with uh, Dr. William Osler. He gave the uh, Culstonian lectures uh, in McGill University, which was eventually published in Lancet as a three series part. Uh, 
uh, it was based on his own clinical observation of about 200 patients, both bedside and in the uh, clinical pathological findings. A uh, lot of uh, things that he noted from his observations hold true even today. Uh, he was able to identify there are two different manifestations, acute, and then that uh, clinical picture lasts for several weeks. And he made a very accurate description of the vegetation. And he noted that it's a combination of platelets, fibrin, and bacteria. He also noted the vegetation is more likely to be found along the valve closure line. And he noted that anterior mitral leaflet was more commonly affected. In the second lecture, he uh, described the clinical manifestations, you know, the typical oscillatorian manifestations uh, we know of. And in the third uh, series, he theorized that it's probably due to a bacterial process or what they call at the time, mycotic process. In 1908, he described the oscillus nodes. So, so a great deal of knowledge comes from his clinical observation and many of his findings still hold true. So let's look at uh, the pathogenesis of vegetation, which is one of the hallmarks of infective endocarditis. Uh, it starts with injury to the valvular endothelium or endocardium, and that subsequently exposes the subendothelial collagen and the matrix molecules. Uh, this exposed endothelium attracts the platelets and fibrin, which eventually form the microthrombus uh, which is basically a sterile vegetation. And when bacteria enters into the bloodstream, it may be uh, as uh, simple as brushing the teeth if uh, people have poor oral hygiene or gingivitis and even chewing food and brushing the teeth can result in transient bacteremia. Uh, if a patient has a central line such as hemodialysis or bad skin lesion or a skin abscess, it can result in bacteremia from the skin pathogens. Um, bacteria can also enter from the GI or the GU tract. And as the bacteria floats into the bloodstream, uh, it can attach to the sterile vegetation and eventually form the infective endocarditis. Uh, certain organisms have a higher propensity to adhere to this sterile vegetation. For example, Staph aureus, can easily uh, adhere to the vegetation uh, as compared to a gram-negative pathogen like an E. coli. Uh, once the bacteria uh, attaches to the platelet fibrin uh, matrix, uh, the mass, uh, the, it stimulates the resting platelets and results in activation and further signal transduction. This results in more aggregation of the platelets and uh, the vegetation keeps growing bigger and bigger. The bacteria within the vegetations multiply and it goes kind of on a vicious cycle and they uh, feed each other, resulting in increase in the size of vegetation. And this uh, picture shows uh, one vegetation and you can see it's very friable and it's more prone to fragmentation. And vegetation is, also very uh, protective environment for the bacteria. The bacteria inside uh, the vegetation are protected from the neutrophils and host defense molecules. So they multiply very quickly without any uh, counter attack from the host immune system. And it is also difficult for the drugs to penetrate into the vegetation. Another thing to point out is inside the vegetation, the colony count is high dense. Um, it's uh, almost like 10 to the power of nine to 10 colony forming units per gram of vegetation. And an important aspect is since the density of the bacteria is so high, uh, they compete with each other for the nutrients that are available. So a, a small or a significant proportion of the population is not actively dividing. They are in a slow growth uh, phase. And this is important because as we uh, use drugs to kill the bugs, certain drugs kill the actively dividing cells better. Uh, 
for example, uh, beta-lactins or vancomycin, which reduce the uh, peptidoglycan synthesis and the cell wall production, uh, if the cell is not actively dividing, they don't need to produce a cell wall and those drugs won't be very effective. The, uh, the vegetation kind of results in uh, certain clinical manifestations or complications that we see in infective endocarditis. Um, you know, uh, it can chew up the valve uh, it can extend into the paravalvular space, resulting paravalvular abscess and subsequently a fistula. It can uh, fragment and embolize to distant parts of the body, including the liver, the spleen, the muscle joints. And if the infectious process is kind of subacute to chronic, the antigen antibody complexes can also create clinical manifestations. So uh, let's talk about native valve endocarditis. Is the rate is around two to 10 cases per 100,000 person years. Uh, as we talked before, rheumatic valvular heart disease is the predominant risk factor in the developing world. In the developed world where rheumatic heart disease uh, has been under control, degenerative valvular disease like aortic sclerosis or congenital heart disease like bicuspid aortic valve uh, or the predominant reason for infective endocarditis. IV drug use, we are in certain parts of the United States. Uh, IV drug use is very um, significant reason for right-sided endocarditis. Uh, healthcare exposure, people have a lot of central lines in place and that can introduce a virulent pathogen like Staph aureus. So worldwide, 80% of uh, the infections are due to gram-positive organisms. In the developing world, uh, uh, as Dr. Mark mentioned, some proportion is due to the oral flora, the viridin streptococci, HASEC, and some are from the skin pathogens, staph aureus and coagulase negative staph. Uh, one thing to point out is coagulase negative staph is a weak bug. It's usually associated with prostatic valves but the, a certain strain of coagulase negative staph called staph lugdunensis is more virulent and it behaves like uh, MSSA, staph aureus, and it can affect the native valve. If you see a uh, strep bovis or intracarcus uh, endocarditis, then uh, the patient would need uh, screening for uh, colon polyps or carcinoma. Uh, the typical board question is a patient has strep bovis or gallolyticus endocarditis, and uh, the, the answer that they are looking for is that it is significantly associated with uh, occult malignancies in the colon. And we are seeing more intracarcus species to behave in the same way. We have seen a lot of um, uh, occult malignancies in the GI tract uh, resulting in intracarcus endocarditis. Um, prostatic valves, um, just a brief history. Uh, the first prostatic valve was in 1952 uh, in the dissenting iota, actually, in the, um, for uh, aortic uh, regurgitation. Uh, in 1960, Starr did a first successful orthotropic valve uh, in the mitral position. And then you probably know that subsequently tilted disc, bileaflet, and uh, bioprocesses such as a hybrid of biological and mechanical structures were eventually developed, and uh, bovine pericardium is another source for tissue processes. Um, since I'm talking to cardiologists, I don't think I need to go in detail about prostate valves. Uh, just to mention, uh, these have uh, dramatic, resulted in dramatic improvements in the outcomes for people with valvular heart disease. Uh, this data is kind of old, a decade old, but 70,000 valve replacements in the US annually, um, 10,000 mechanical, 60,000 bioprostic valves. Uh, here in the US at least, most of them are due to degenerative valve disease. Uh, around 300,000 valve replacements done worldwide. If uh, the infection involves a prostatic valve, it can be life-threatening. Uh, 
the incidence is around one to six percent and the incident is highest in the first three months of surgery. As you can imagine, in the first three months, uh, if it's a mechanical valve, the surface is not endothelialized and the interface between the uh, mechanical valve analyst and the endocardium is prone to get uh, contamination and then subsequently infective endocarditis. Uh, over the decades, the proportion of prostate valve endocarditis among uh, all cases of endocarditis have gone up. Uh, right now it's 16 to 33%, depending on the geography of the world. Uh, the, there is another question which always comes up is uh, if there is any difference in mechanical versus bioprostic valve uh, in terms of risk for endocarditis. If you look at the cumulative risk, say after five years, the risk of endocarditis is almost very similar between the two. But uh, during the first three months, the mechanical valve is slightly at a higher risk compared to the bioprosthetic. And the reason, as we talked earlier, is because it takes time for the mechanical valve to endothelialize. On the other hand, bioprosthetic valve, they are prone to degenerate uh, after a you know, few years, and the risk goes up subsequently. Early onset is uh, described as less than one year. Late onset is more than one year. Uh, early onset, uh, at least in the first three months, is due to contamination of the valve during the uh, implantation or hematogenous seeding during the perioperative period. If they have a UTI or a line-related bacteremia or fungemia, it can go and attach to the vulnerable healing tissue. Uh, and this is reflected in the pathogens that we see. Staph aureus form uh, the bulk, followed by coagulase negative staph, gram negatives, and then fungal organism. Fortunately, this uh, trend is declining, and that's due to the infection control, better surgical techniques, antimicrobial prophylaxis, and so on. The late onset, which happens one year or several years down the line, uh, tends to resemble the pathogens that we see in the community. If it's from uh, oral flora, such as streptococci, GI uh, flora like enterococcus can seed and cause infective endocarditis. And if the patient has uh, like ongoing healthcare exposure, like uh, you know hemodialysis patient with the central line or frequent access, uh, they can get infected with staph aureus or MRSA or gram negatives. We talked about the changing trend in the um, in the U in the Western world. Uh, there is a huge uh, increase in the aging population, and more patients undergo invasive procedure and prosthetic valve implantation. And so we are seeing more uh, that are um, common in the elderly population. This uh, trend results in a uh, high number of patients associated with staph aureus. So if you look at the recent data, like staph aureus has become the most common uh, cause for infections uh, of all cases. And that is, this is because we are seeing infective endocarditis among elderly patients with a lot of uh, comorbid conditions and healthcare exposure. Uh, especially if it's a prostate valve, staph aureus and coagulase negative staph form the bulk of infections. And central venous catheter is the single most important risk factor uh, for staph aureus, uh, both community onset healthcare associated, which is basically patients who get chemotherapy or hemodialysis or hospital onset endocarditis. Okay. So let's talk about the clinical features. Uh, the two important features are fever and a heart murmur. And they are present in about 90 and 70 percent respectively. And if it's uh, complicated patients, they may present with heart failure, stroke, sepsis, or signs of embolization. Subacute, uh, people have kind of low-grade fever, they've been feeling unwell for several weeks or months, arthralgias, chills, 
And in this segment of population, you can expect to see the oscillatorian manifestations. The clinical manifestations depend on the virulence of the pathogen. For example, Staph aureus is a highly virulent pathogen. So patient present with acute manifestation. Uh, on the other hand, viridin streptococci is a very weak pathogen. It doesn't cause um, like severe sepsis like most of the time. Um, so on the right, you see the pictures of uh, the oscillatorian manifestations. Uh, on the top right, you see Janeway lesions. These are painless uh, lesions present in the palm and sole. Uh, on the bottom, you see osseless node, which was first described in 1908, painful uh, to touch in the rot spots. Uh, you can see splinter hemorrhage, conjunctival hemorrhage, uh, and so on. But I have to uh, kind of emphasize that these manifestations are seen uh, in patients who have been ill for at least several weeks. As you can imagine, the immune uh, uh, manifestations need time for the body to produce antibodies. So that's around two to three years, two to three weeks. So these are present only in subacute patients who haven't been to the doctor initially. Uh, in acute patients, we seldom see these signs and these are present in less than 5% of patients. Modified Duke criteria is a diagnostic framework that we use and the two pillars of uh, the major criteria are blood culture that shows typical pathogen and persistent bacteremia and a positive echocardiogram. A new valvular regurgitation is another um, major criteria and the minor criteria are fever, vascular phenomena, immune phenomena, predisposing condition and a positive culture that doesn't meet major criteria. And one uh, thing to note is that Duke criteria was initially developed for epidemiological studies. It was not intended to use in clinical setting to diagnose endocarditis. Having said that, you know, it has been in clinical practice for decades and there has been several prospective and observational studies which has validated it that it is good for use in clinical settings. It is not 100%. It has a sensitivity of about 80% for native valve endocarditis. It is not very good for prosthetic valve endocarditis or pacemaker ICD endocarditis right-sided endocarditis or culture negative endocarditis. And if uh, the due criteria is negative, uh, the negative predictive value uh, is low. So modified due criteria is the diagnostic framework we use, but it has a lot of limitations. So, uh, you know, as we discussed, you know, positive blood cultures is one of the major criteria, one of the pillars and a hallmark of diagnosing infective endocarditis, but sometimes the cultures are negative. And uh, these most of the time are due to previous antibiotic exposure. And that's the bulk of patients with uh, culture negative endocarditis. And depending on the geography uh, of the world where the patient is from, the other uncommon um, conditions uh, may be they're like a Bartonella, Brucella, Q fever, and Whipple disease. And uh, we'll talk briefly about those. So in among the homeless population in the US, uh, in the big cities, California, uh, in New York State, uh, Bartonella endocarditis is one of the common causes for culture negative endocarditis. Uh, these are uh, transmitted by a human body louse. The bacteria is Bartonella quintana, uh, which also cause trench fever and paleosis and HIV. And sometimes Bartonella hensley, which is commonly associated with cat scratch disease, uh, can also cause uh, culture negative endocarditis. So if the cultures are negative, how do we diagnose them? Then first we look at the risk factors. And then if we suspect uh, culture negative endocarditis, then you have to do additional serology workup. And if you have the resected valve tissue, you can do 
uh, PCR for the Bartonella. Uh, it can be a specific primer, targeted primer, or a broad range PCR um, identifying the 16S ribosomal genetic element. Q fever, uh, it's called Q uh, because initially when the clinical uh, picture was emerging, they didn't know what it was, so it was query or unknown. It was first described in Queensland in Australia, and now it is a very common cause for uh, culture negative inf infective endocarditis in Southern Europe, especially France, Marseille region, and the Middle East. Uh, these are due to exposure to cattle, sheep, and goats, and again, we diagnose based on serology and PCR. Uh, phase one antibody titer of more than one is to 800 is considered one of the major criteria in the modified Dukes framework. It is important that we think about culture negative endocarditis uh, because these uh, cases we require prolonged antibiotic treatment, so combination with doxycycline and hydroxychloroquine for several months or even years. Uh, so the typical regimen that we use will not be sufficient. Whipple disease is another cause of culture negative endocarditis. Uh, Whipple disease is a multi-system disease. People present with weight loss, uh, chronic diarrhea, orthralgias, and the gold standard for diagnosis is a small bubble biopsy and you see uh, PAS positive uh, foamy macrophages. And uh, people have reported in France that the cases are going up. It's not very high, it's still below hundreds, but the cases are going up depending on uh, the region of the world. And if you resect a valve, you can do uh, the staining and you can see uh, the uh, foamy macrophages. And you, uh, the slide C on the bottom right uh, shows the uh, macrophages. Again, these require prolonged combination regimen. Uh, so it's very important, depending on where the patient is from, to get uh, uh, these uh, testing. Okay. So we talked about uh, making uh, etiological diagnosis, you know, the blood cultures and the serology and the PCR. Then the role, the next pillar of modified criteria is echocardiogram. And this is very because uh, we are not seeing the oscillatory manifestations to make a clinical diagnosis. So it is very important if you suspect endocarditis to go with echo. And this is illustrated in a uh, prospective study uh, done by Fowler and all at in Duke University. And he they did uh, uh, like 103 patients uh, both TEE and TTE. And what they found was clinical signs of endocarditis was present only in about 7% of those who eventually diagnosed with endocarditis. And transthoracic echo was sensitive only in 35%. And this uh, study kind of uh, uh, resulted in a paradigm shift in our thinking, and they kind of uh, uh, pushed towards transesophageal echocardiogram, especially in patients with staph or is bactremia. We all know that uh, TEE is superior to TTE, especially for the diagnosis of prostate valve endocarditis. Uh, TEE is far superior than transthoracic. So if the transthoracic echocardiogram is negative and your clinical suspicion persists, you should always do TEE. It is very important uh, to detect abscesses, fistula, paraprostatic leaks, and TEE has a negative predictive value of about 90%. So even if the TEE is negative, it doesn't mean that it's com uh, completely clear. And, and the reason for that is uh, the timing, optimal timing of doing TEE is kind of uh, unknown. And if we do, T early in the course of uh, the endocarditis, there may not have been enough time for the vegetation to form and we may miss uh, the diagnosis. So if we routinely do repeat TEE after uh, one week, 
if the initial T is negative and the clinical suspicion persists. And this is especially important for patients with staph or bacteremia, which, are, which is a very common clinical scenario here. Then uh, the role of uh, PET CT and PET CT has become one of the important diagnostic uh, tool in our acumen, especially for patients with prostate valve endocarditis or those with pacemaker and uh, ICD. Uh, the basic idea is uh, uh, the labeled glucose is uh, taken up by the activated uh, WBCs because they express high density of uh, glucose transporters. So it helps to localize infection and uh, it is more predictive of an infection if the uptake is uh, focal and heterogeneous. And I will show you some pictures later. And it is important that patients undergo a good protocol before the uh, test. So they have to be on a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, fasting period for 14 to 18 hours. And depending on center protocol, uh, they get heparin before the tracer administration and the glucose have to be less than 180 milligram per liter. This uh, has few studies have shown that PET-CT is useful in uh, endocarditis diagnosis, especially in those patients when the modified new criteria uh, puts them in the possible bucket for endocarditis. It doesn't uh, rule in or rule out. So in these kind of uh, gray area patients, the PET-CT is able to either confirm that they have endocarditis or reject the diagnosis of endocarditis. So uh, it, it, it has a sensitivity of 90% and specificity of 78%. So I see a role of PET-CT in those patients who we are not sure uh, and the criteria says that they might have a possible infective endocarditis. Uh, it has been added as an option in the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. Um, American guidelines have not included it. Um, uh, so Dr. Badur is the first author and uh, he is we're still waiting for uh, you know the next iteration probably, but um, I, the current guideline does not include it as a major criteria. So here you can see on the left uh, there is a focal and heterogeneous uptake around the prostatic valve, and it is usually around the um, the annulus. On the right, you have prostatic valve, but there is no uptake, so that's negative for endocarditis. And another thing that to mention, uh, why the PET-CT is more uh, useful in prostatic valve is that in prostatic valve, the infection is in the interface between the uh, prostatic valve annulus and the endocardium. On the other hand, in the native valve, the infection mainly starts in the uh, along the line of valve closure. So the PET-CT won't be able to sensitively pick up that. Here you can see uh, focal and heterogeneous uptake along the aortic arch, again, prosthetic aortic arch. Here you can see uptake in the uh, pacemaker pocket. And one thing we have noticed, and it has been reported in many studies, is that uh, among patients who undergo PET-CD for some other reason, uh, either in patients with staph or bacteremia or those with endocarditis, we tend to pick up some occult infections. So in this patient, you can see there is an uptake in the vertebral body and the disc space. On the right, there is an occult uh, infection that was picked up in the spleen, and these are clinically occult infections. So there is still a, a debate going on whether routine PET would be an indicate, indicated test in patients with endocarditis or staph or is bacteria to identify these occult infections. Um, we can skip this. Okay, so what about infection after TAVR? Uh, the 
uh, initial expectation was that the uh, the tower will be uh, the incidence will be lower than an open heart surgery. The thought was it was less in invasive and so on. But the data shows it's similar or you know similar to slightly high compared to surgical prostate valve replacements. And another thing is the inpatient mortality is actually higher uh, than uh, uh, patients who undergo open heart uh, prostate valve replacements. And as you can imagine, you know, at least during the initial time, TAVR was usually placed in high-risk patient populations who are not a candidate for surgery. And if they get an infection, that just tips them over. And that can be one explanation why they have a higher mortality compared to prostate valve endocarditis uh, from open heart surgery. Okay. So uh, we have talked about the etiology and we have talked about the diagnostic frame, framework, uh, blood cultures, echocardiogram, PET CT. Uh, the next is the antibiotic management. Uh, since the audience is cardiologists, I'm not going to uh, dwell into the individual antibiotic regimens. Uh, but the principles are we want the antibiotic drug to kill the bug. We want a bactericidal drug, not a bacteriostatic. We want the drug to penetrate into the vegetation. So the drug concentration to be high uh, to achieve that uh, goal. The next is we have to give prolonged course of antibiotic. And the reason is something that we discussed earlier the vegetation is a protective environment. Some bacterial colonies are highly dividing, some are in static growth. So in order to kill all the bacteria in different stages, uh, we have to give prolonged causes of antibiotic. Key points for the preferred regimen, if this bacteria is susceptible, uh, beta-lactam is the preferred regimen. Uh, for streptococci, um, ceftriaxone or a penicillin drug would be a preferred option. For methicillin susceptible, staph aureus, uh, anti staphylococcal uh, penicillin such as oxicillin and nafcillin are the preferred regimens. We often use cefazolin mainly because uh, people don't tolerate oxicillin and nafcillin very well after a few days or weeks. And uh, so we tend to give oxycillin and nafcillin while they are in the hospital. And uh, when they are ready to be discharged, we transition to cefazolin. Another point to remember is uh, uh, cefazolin doesn't penetrate the uh, central nervous system. So if you suspect there is an infection in the, uh, in the brain uh, or the meninges, cefazolin is not a good choice. And another theoretical disadvantage of using cefazolin is that uh, what is called as inoculum effect. We know that the vegetation has a high density of bacteria and they may produce enough beta-lactamase to kill cefazolin. So at least during the initial phase, there is a chance for failure. Again, it's theoretical. People have used cefazolin right from the get-go in certain centers. For MRSA, vancomycin and daptomycin are reasonable choices. Uh, vancomycin is not very uh, good drug, uh, but it's something that we have to deal with. Uh, daptomycin has a um, higher bactericidal capacity than vancomycin, uh, so daptomycin is an option. Uh, in persistent MRSA bacteremia, uh, for salvage therapy, we all sometimes use daptomycin plus ceftorolene, which is a fourth generation cephalosporin uh, that can target the penicillin binding protein 2A, uh, which is uh, the reason for methicillin resistance. Uh, there was a recent study uh, com comparing uh, the combination of daptomycin and uh, cephalosporin versus uh, monotherapy with vancomycin or daptomycin. Uh, and that did not show difference between the two regimens. Uh, 
So we, you, we use naptomycin and septorolene only for salvage option. For intracoccus species, it's sometimes very hard to treat. There is a high chance for relapse. Uh, the previous preferred regimen was ampicillin plus gentamicin. As you can imagine, that can be toxic, especially in elder population. And study from Europe last decade noted that combination of cefriaxin plus penicillin can be equally effective and less toxic. So this has become the preferred regimen for intracoccus species that is penicillin susceptible. So where do we use gentamicin? Only for prostate valves. So uh, role of uh, aminoglycosides, it was almost, in, if you look at the guidelines, it was in almost all the uh, regimens in the previous guidelines because there is a good synergy between beta-lactamase, beta-lactams and aminoglycosides. Um, but if you look at clinical studies, um, the benefit is very modest. They reduce fever and the duration of bacteremia by just one day. On the other hand, the risk of nephrotoxicity is very high. And even in the daptomycin trial that was published in NEJM, gentamicin was an independent risk, for, risk factor for nephrotoxicity. So we don't use gentamicin for most of our patients. For staph aureus prostatic valve endocarditis, it is still in the guidelines for the first two weeks. For MSSA, uh, it's a combination of uh, either nafcillin or cefazolin plus rifampin for six weeks, and gentamicin is added for two weeks. For MRSA, instead of uh, cefazolin, we use vancomycin. And as you can see, combination of vancomycin and gentamicin can result in nephrotoxicity very easily. Uh, so even though we start gentamicin, the first uh, uh, sign that there is a trend towards increased creatinine or reduced cl renal clearance, we tend to stop gentamicin. Other agents, uh, linezolid, um, the limitation is uh, more than two weeks. They are patients are more prone for thrombocytopenia. Tedizolid is another thing, but we haven't used it. Uh, Dalbavancin, Telavancin, Oritavancin, these are long acting uh, uh, lipoglycopeptides. Uh, they have not been studied for endocarditis. And as you can imagine, it's very, very hard to um, do a randomized clinical trial for patients with endocarditis. Uh, I tried to uh, start a Dalbavancin trial, but we couldn't enroll patients. Uh, endocarditis is very rare, so it's very hard to find patients to enroll. And if you have a patient and you give them a choice that this is a study drug compared uh, to something that's uh, known to be effective, and if we are wrong, the mortality is around 20, 30%, nobody wants to enroll. Uh, so I don't, I'm not optimistic that we will have a good clinical trial with these drugs. Next, what is the role of surgery? Um, if a patient is in heart failure due to valve dehiscence or fistula, that's a clear cut indication. If there is a perivalar valve abscess, that's a clear cut indication because we need to have source control. If the infection is due to a highly resistant MDR pseudomonas, for example, or a fungi, it's very hard to get rid of the infection with antimicrobial therapy alone. Uh, so we tend to uh, recommend surgery. There is another uh, soft indication, like if the patient has recurrent emboli and the vegetation is more than 10 millimeter in size, to prevent uh, further embolization, one could consider surgery. Role of early surgery, very, very limited data. This study is from Korea and very small study, 37 versus 39 patients. Early surgery was uh, defined as surgery within 48 hours of randomization. And it noted uh, 
that it reduced uh, streptococcal, uh, the risk of embolization, uh, but it's a very, very small study. It was mainly in patients with streptococcal endocarditis. Most of them had mitral valve endocarditis. Uh, it did not have uh, staph aureus to a good extent. In prostatic valves, especially with staph aureus, uh, there are some data from prospective cohort studies that early valve surgery improves uh, mortality. Again, these are all small studies and uh, uh, the decision to see whether the patient needs surgery has to be involved in the multidisciplinary setting involving the cardiologist, the cardiovascular surgeon, the infectious disease specialist. So it's, these are all uh, individualized uh, to patient scenario. Uh, so the risk of embolization um, is greatest during the first week and it goes down by week two. Uh, so uh, in several studies, including one uh, from Mayo Clinic, Dr. Stickelberg study in 1991, uh, showed that the risk of embolization goes dramatically down in two weeks with antibiotic therapy. Okay. Uh, as we discussed before, staph aureus is uh, highly virulent. It has become the number one cause of endocarditis, both in the native valve and the prostate valve scenario, and also in the ICD pacemaker scenario in the world. And one of the reasons is it has a lot of surface proteins, uh, the microbial surface components, recognizing the uh, intercellular adhesive matrix molecules, it can uh, bind to uh, fibrin and clumping factors. If a patient has a prostate valve and develops staph aureus bacteremia, almost half of them will eventually uh, be diagnosed with endocarditis. So uh, these patients almost always need a TE. They have high mortality rate and perivalvular complications are also very common. So these patients need a TEE as soon as possible. So this is a uh, algorithm or predict scoring system to guide uh, who needs uh, echocardiogram in patients with staph aureus bacteremia. As you can see, if a patient has a prostatic valve ICD pacemaker, and uh, the onset of bacteremia was in the community, they have a score of more than four. And that puts them at high risk for complications. They might have perivalvular complications, complications that request early surgery. So these patients require TEE within the few, first few days of admission. Okay. Um, we still don't know a lot about um, endocarditis. Areas of future research include the role of PET-CT, uh, the role of molecular diagnosis, uh, role of carrier test. It is a new test using metagenomic approach uh, to diagnose uh, endocarditis. Very few data is available right now. Um, sometimes it can be challenging to interpret a positive uh, test result uh, because it might pick up transient bacteremia and the positive pathogen that you see in the carrier's test may not correlate with what's involving the heart valve. We don't know the role of routine MRI to detect silent embolic lesions. MRI brain is indicated for those uh, patients who are going into surgery just to make sure that they don't have a hemorrhagic lesion or a big enough embolic lesions which may uh, transition to hemorrhagic lesion. Uh, we still have to learn a lot about the role of PET-CT in staph aureus bacteremia uh, to look for occult embolic lesions. Uh, we don't know much about the timing of surgery. The general dictum is you delay surgery for four weeks. If the CNS embolism is more than two centimeter or if it's a hemorrhagic lesion. Okay, so one, one recent study you might have seen uh, is the uh, 
uh, partial oral treatment for endocarditis. It was published last year in NEGM. Uh, this was done in Denmark, and uh, they uh, gave um, IV antibiotics for the first uh, five to 10 days and then transition them to oral antibiotic therapy to complete the treatment course. Only 20% who underwent screening were enrolled in the study. So it's a very, very small subgroup of population. And they use unconventional oral antibiotic regimen that we normally don't use. Uh, and very few staph aureus and nobody with MRSA. And like uh, the reason they did the study in Denmark was that in Denmark, they keep the patient in the hospital for the entire six weeks or four weeks of IV antibiotic therapy. So in order to reduce their resource utilization, they kind of, uh, uh, that was the motivation for the oral antibiotic therapy. But these patients were followed twice weekly uh, so these are not the typical patients that we see at least in the United States. So we have not, uh, it's, it's almost uh, impossible to kind of uh, use this scenario for staph aureus or MRSA prostate valve endocarditis. So in a very small sub-segment sub of patient population, for example, uh, viridin streptococci, native valve, no complications at all, there is a chance that you can complete the regimen with outpatient antibiotic oral options, but you have to follow them very closely. All right. So infective endocarditis prophylaxis, um, I will briefly touch up on that. It was started in the 1950s when the penicillin was widely available for commercial use. So at the time there was so much enthusiasm about the wonder drug of penicillin and the antibiotics and the American Heart Association caught on that phenomenon. And then they recommended dental GI, uh, GU procedures should need uh, antibiotic prophylaxis in a lot of population. But the causal relationship between infective endocarditis and these procedures were never established in randomized or controlled studies. And we know that regular day-to-day -day activities such as uh, brushing the teeth or skin scratches are more likely to cause transient bacteremia and subsequently infective endocarditis than just uh, like giving prophylaxis during those uh, once a year uh, procedures. Uh, the first uh, society, uh, the French society was the first one to say, you know, we are not going to do uh, these antibiotic prophylaxis anymore. And they recommended that only uh, high risk patients should get endo, uh, prophylaxis. Subsequently in 2007, and American Heart Association, Dr. Wilson and Badur document, uh, 2009 European Society of Cardiology. They agreed with the French, which is very rare uh, situation. Uh, and they uh, recommended endocarditis prophylaxis only in high risk population. Those with previous infective endocarditis or those with prostate valve or immunodeficiency disorder. In 2008, uh, UK guidelines came with the most radical uh, recommendations and they said no antibiotic prophylaxis even for high risk patient population. And since then many studies have come out to see whether this change in the guidelines have resulted in an increased trend of streptococcus infective endocarditis. And as you can imagine, um, the oral uh, antibiotic prophylaxis is mainly for uh, preventing endocarditis through oral streptococci. They won't prevent MRSA, they won't prevent staph aureus. And because of the changing trend in the endocarditis, uh, infective endocarditis due to streptococci has gone down. Thornhill and all looked at the UK population-wide data looking at approximately 15 million population, and they didn't see any upward trend of streptococcal infective endocarditis. Uh, 
dual and all looked at the French data, population-based data, and they didn't see any increase in streptococcal endocarditis. D. Simone uh, from Mayo Clinic, he looked at uh, population-wide data from Rochester, just one uh, county. So it's not nationwide, just a county in Minnesota, and did not see any upward uh, trend of streptococci. Pant and all looked at uh, US guidelines and that there was no significant change. So far, uh, seven studies have come out and looking at the systematic review, there was no change in the incidence of um, endocarditis. So what about uh, the situation in India? I, I think oral hygiene is the most important thing if you want to reduce uh, streptococcal infective endocarditis especially among patients who have underlying rheumatic uh, heart disease. Uh, so I, uh, I would speculate that oral hygiene is more important than giving um, antibiotic prophylaxis. But I would like to hear from Dr. Math and other colleagues from India to get their perspective. Uh, so I'll start with the, stop with the summary slide. Um, Staph aureus has emerged as the most common pathogen, especially among those with prostate valves and healthcare exposure. Modified due criteria as a framework uh, for the diagnosis, but we have to understand that it has several limitations. TEE is a preferred echocardiographic modality, especially for those with prostate valves and to look for periannular complication. PET-CT is promising especially uh, in those with uh, negative TEE and still have high clinical suspicion. Minimum duration of antibiotic is six weeks. Bactericidal drugs are preferred. Decision for surgery should be individualized. Uh, oral step down is an option, but only for low risk native valve streptococcal infection. And they need very close clinical monitoring and uh, a multidisciplinary team involving cardiologists, surgeons, ID, pharmacy, OPAT team is important to care for this very serious uh, group of patients. All right, that's all I have. I will stop now and ask any questions. It was a wonderful talk, Dr. Bharat. Very lucid, very and comprehensive. You started with the history, the way back, right in the 1600s, and went through the Osler. I mean, uh, William Osler's lectures, then diagnosis, pathogenesis. Uh, I, I don't think you really left anything out for us to discuss. Uh, it's, it was a wonderful lecture, and you kept our attention. I mean, that's great for all our cardiologists who, who tend to have this attention deficit disorders. We can't sit for more than 10 minutes going through and you did it for one hour. So that's that's great. So um, if there are any questions from the audience, I mean, we can start taking them one by one. Dr. Uh, Dr. Sadarandam, you would like to start out? Hello. Yeah, there is a question from Jayanti Swamusundram. What is your policy in getting blood culture, number, quantity of blood growth, etc.? This is from audience. Uh, so we uh, tend to get uh, three sets of blood cultures. Uh, we don't repeat it within 15 minutes. Uh, it's usually separated by a few hours. Uh, so what I, uh, I do is uh, I do one set in the morning, one set in the evening, and one set the next day. And again, it has to be individualized based on you know, the clinical scenario. If the patient is kind of clinically stable, I think uh, it's better to spread out the blood cultures without any antimicrobial exposure. On the other hand, you know, if the patient has already received antibiotics, uh, then uh, that won't help. So uh, we try to get blood cultures, but at that time, getting multiple blood cultures is not going to be very useful. Uh, there was another part of the question uh, about the uh, broth. I mean, broth. you take uh, 
like routine fungal cultures always or it's uh, no routine fungal cultures so um two sets of uh, like one from one arm the other from the other arm and each draw will be put into three bottles so totally uh, six bottles do you use the routine cultures or you take the back back tech cultures back tech back yeah. tech ones. Oh. back tech and once the uh, the blood cultures are positive then we use molditoff uh, no. matrix associated laser de absorption ionization time of flight uh, the simplest form is molditoff mm -hmm. and that quickly gives us the identification of the bacteria but right. for the benefit of uh, audience if a patient comes to you for if you if you get a consult to evaluate a suspected patient with infected endocarditis, uh, how do you approach that consult? Okay, um, so the most common uh, situation that we see um, or staph aureus bacteria. Uh, so the consult we get is you know patient comes in and um, comes in with fever and the blood cultures for staph aureus are positive. So that's the common scenario that I get involved in. And then uh, I, I see what risk factors the patient has, you know, pacemaker, uh, ICD, prosthetic valve that puts them at high risk. And that's a clear situation. Then we do a TEE. If the TE is negative, but the clinical suspicion still persists, then we go with PET CT. The other uh, situation we see is patients with intracaucus bacteremia. Uh, again, we see a lot of elderly patients with underlying colonic malignancy or um, mucosal disruption, uh, and they, that's another common scenario that we see. It's uh, to look for endocarditis. I don't typically see a lot of subacute cases. And part of it is because those low uh, virulent cases are usually managed in the primary hospital. They don't usually refer them to, you know, tertiary center. So in the tertiary center, like we typically see, uh, you know, patients with, um, you know, perianular abscess or um, prosthetic uh, valve endocarditis. So only when there is a complication, they send us to our center. So uh, I don't typically see the uh, subacute cases. If your right. patient is going to be hemodynamically stable uh, with a possible suspected uh, vegetation in ECO, uh, what would have been your approach? Is it straight away going with antibiotics or you would like to send cultures and wait? Uh... Right, absolutely. Like uh, getting blood cultures is the key. So if the patient is hemodynamically stable, uh, I would wait for at least 12 to 16 hours to get three sets of blood cultures. And if the first set of blood cultures, you know, turn positive within, a, within six to eight hours, then you can immediately start the uh, antibiotics without waiting for further cultures. But if the, the point uh, I think you're trying to make is if the patient is clinically stable and you suspect endocarditis, it's very important to get blood cultures before you start empiric antibiotic therapy. So related to that, we have the next question from Dr. Sai Krishna Reddy. What is the status of gentamicin in the current scenario for IE, especially in India, where our blood cultures are negative most of the times? So just to add from my point, when I did my study, that was a prospective study of 104 patients more than a decade back, somewhere between 2004 to 2007, at Ames, which is the Apex uh, Premier Institute, we had a culture positive rates of only 40%. And a decade later, now at my institute in, in South India and in Bangalore, Jayadeva, it's it's sixty percent. And we still most of our positive cultures still don't satisfy the Duke's major criteria that is you need to have at least two out of three or all three positives, just usually one positive culture. So in that background, what would you recommend, Dr. Bharat, about the role of gentamicin? Okay. And, and given that oh. we still have streps strep as the predominant organism. Right. So good question. So if 
streptococci is a predominant pathogen. And if we assume that majority of these culture negative endocarditis are due to antibiotic exposure, but the pathogen is streptococci, I would not use gentamicin. Uh, ceftriaxone should be um, enough. Uh, adding gentamicin to cover for streptococci um, doesn't add much uh, in terms of benefit, but increases the risk for nephrotoxicity. So personally, I would not use gentamicin um, if we are assuming that most of them are due to streptococci. And in any other scenario, would you prefer gentamicin for a culture negative endocarditis? Uh, uh, so one, so the situation that I can think of is um, a, like a prostate valve endocarditis uh, in the healthcare setting, immediate post-op, we are suspecting gram negative pathogens like pseudomonas and depending upon the susceptibility that is prevalent in the hospital, if it's uh, more prone to be resistant to one group of drugs, say cefepime, you can use combination with the aminoglycoside. Uh, the other scenario is if you suspect a prostate valve endocarditis and you suspect it could be due to MRSA, then you can use gentamicin for the first uh, two weeks. So for native valve, uh, I would stay away from endo, uh, gentamicin. Even if you suspect enterococcal endocarditis, uh, and then combination of ceftriaxone plus ampicillin is preferred over gentamicin. Thank you. Any other questions we have? How common you, do you encounter systemic uh, complications, not the local complications? Systemic complication or infection the carditis in your practice, brother? Uh, it's very, very common. So uh, the, the more you look for, uh, the more you will find. Uh, like clinical signs, probably around 20 to 30% of the time, we see vertebral osteomyelitis. Uh, the patients complain of back pain and you do a uh, MRI, you find discitis or osteomyelitis or sometimes, uh, um, you know, muscle abscess and so on. On the other hand, if you do uh, PET CT, I'm uh, sure that we will find even more. So there is so in, in, in Mayo Clinic, when we looked at staph aureus uh, patients uh, who underwent uh, PET CT, up to like five to 10% had occult infection that we didn't identify clinically. So the, if you look really carefully, you will find them. I would say like 20 to 30%. And in, in, in the study from uh, uh, Duke, uh, they looked specifically at staph aureus and if it's a community onset staph aureus bacteremia and they have a prostate valve or like a valvular heart disease, the complication rate is around 30%. And the more risk factors they have, the higher the uh, complication rate. And one, uh, one thing I would add is the longer the bacteremia is, the higher chance for complication. So it's common sense, you know, the more the time the bacteria is circulating in the systemic circulation, uh, the more time or chance it has to kind of stick on to vulnerable spots like a healing uh, disc space or a healing muscle. But one more thing, uh, what, is there any role of PET during uh, uh, early phase of uh, post-op situation? There will be some amount of inflammation during the early post-op. Yeah. Right. So early post-op, like, you know, first uh, 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 even 90 days, PET CT may not be very useful because there will be healing process, there will be uptake. Uh, and theoretically, the, uh, the healing process will have a uniform uptake around the annular space rather than the focal and the heterogeneous. So in the uh, in the slide I showed you, it was more uh, uh, heterogeneous, sorry. 
Uh, so that's one clue. But again, like in the immediate post-op, it's kind of hard to differentiate and it may not have a important role. So here you can see the uptake is spotty. It's it's not here, it's it's in different spots. Okay. It's not uniformly around the um, the annulus. So that's one clue, but again, uh, it's just a clue. Uh, Dr. Bharat, coming back to culture negative endocarditis, because that's the big uh, problem in India. So you said that you take your blood culture for, uh, for a hemodynamically stable patient, you take your blood culture and you wait. Uh, how long can we wait? 48 hours? Uh, Three days? How, how long? I mean, because as you said, the longer you wait, the longer is the bacteremia and the greater are the complications. Uh, right. So I would wait for like, uh, like 24 hours. In waiting longer than that, it's not going to help. And then if it's negative, you would go with uh, empiric thera therapy? Right. right. So I would uh, get uh, three sets of blood cultures within 12 to 24 hours. And then uh, you can start the empiric regimen. Because in India, most of the IE, the endocarditis is still managed by cardiologists. Of course, the corporate hospitals do have uh, ID specialists nowadays who do come and help us. But I work in a public hospital and, you know, it's all left to the cardiologist to do everything. I mean, decide whether which antibiotic to give, which and when to refer to surgeons, everything comes on to the cardiologist. So that's that's the reason I'm asking those questions. Yep. So we have any other? Yeah, we have got one more question from Dr. Jacob Joseph. Uh, the sir was a professor and head of CMC Velo. So I was asking you a question. So... Is there, do you see a mural vegetation in the LV without involving, uh, without involving the valves? And if this is very big, will you submit the patient for surgery? In a, this has, this he has seen in an immunocompromised patient. So what's your opinion on the same? Uh, it, it can happen, uh, but it's not a common thing that we see. Uh, but it can definitely happen, uh, you know, if there is a, um, endothelial damage other than the valve, it can get infected and uh, it, it is still called endocarditis, but uh, typically we haven't seen that many cases. And if the vegetation is large, again, it, it, it is a uh, multidisciplinary ap approach. We have to ask the cardiologists and the cardiovascular surgeons to get an opinion. And I would uh, think that they would go for surgery. I have a naive question, Bharat. I'm sorry to ask this question, but we see bacterial infection, let's see, iotitis, fungal iotitis, but why not viral, especially in this era? Um, <laughs> COVID question, okay. <laughs> well, you know, uh, if you look at it, uh, virus can affect the endo cardium right like in the myocardium but yeah, it doesn't uh, viral myocardium is known but uh, the other organs uh, other endothelium uh, currently the covid has been shown to be involving endothelium leading to endothelitis uh, right and those are micro emboli right uh, in like uh, there are cases where uh, like the smaller arteries are kind of affected by covid with the micro thrombus uh, the question why viruses don't infect the vegetation, right? So there is an endothelial damage, there is platelet and fibrin clot formation, and we don't see any viral endocarditis. And the reason is, you know, bacteria can adhere to extracellular matrix and they multiply on their own, but the virus needs to invade a cell and it needs a cell to multiply. So the vegetation is not a good place for it because it's just a, a mattress of fibrin and uh, uh, platelets. Okay, so we have another question by Dr. Aditya Ruya. Do we routinely change antibiotics based on the MICs? Okay. For example, uh, you have you have chosen one antibiotic and you find that there's another antibiotic now which has a better MIC. Would you go okay. for that or you continue with the same? All right. So 
so if uh, f- like for example like cefazolin so mic is 2 and oxycelin mic is 4 uh, it doesn't mean that uh, cefazolin is better than oxycelin uh, based on lower mic value so the mic is very specific to for that particular drug so we cannot interpret which antibiotic is better based on their relative mics uh if uh, so all we care about is whether it's sensitive or resistant because the mic value for that particular bacteria for that particular drug it's all uh, kind of related uh, on the other hand you know if uh, the mic for vancomycin is 2 and creeping towards 4 then uh, it is less effective and we carefully follow them to see if there is any failure oh thank you coming to one point that you um, touched upon the role of routine mri is to pick up silent infarctions or or for example, for that matter even mr angiogram to pick up aneurysms uh, where do we stand or where do you stand on that do would you do routinely or uh so that, that that's a good question so if you uh, look at the data from sweden in sweden they uh, they argue that every patient with endocarditis should undergo mri brain and m- many times they find very small occult embolic lesions and the question is how clinically significant they are you know if the patient is not a surgical candidate Uh, i don't think it makes a big difference to do mri in that situation but if the patient is going for immediate surgery then we want to know whether there is embolic lesion or whether there is a um, chance for it to become um, hemorrhagic or whether there is a mycotic aneurysm so in patients who are going for surgery yes everybody gets a mri sometimes mra but we don't do routine mri for all patients with endocarditis obviously if they have a stroke symptoms they do get it but for clinically asymptomatic patients i do not think it makes a big difference in the clinical management so i uh, so i had an interesting case and and she's now admitted again with me and she basically had endocarditis of the mitral valve uh, due to staph it was very unusual that first was a normal valve it, it it wasn't even traumatic and she had a large splenic abscess and the entire mitral valve was chewed up and so she underwent surgery after 3 weeks of uh, i mean uh, appropriate antibiotics got this she underwent a combined mitral valve replacement with splenectomy the cardiac surgeon did both the, both the, both the surgeries went home very well now two months later she came back to us with acetrom coagulopathy i mean warfarin coagulopathy because her inr was not well managed at home and we found that she had a small cns bleed with a mycotic aneurysm so now <laughs> we had to stop her she is now admitted with us we had to stop her anticoagulation and we just we are monitoring the cns bleed and that mycotic aneurysm that's sort of leaking Yes, yeah, staph, yeah, staphylococcus is kind of a very, very virulent uh, pathogen, and uh, like uh, a couple of months ago, I had a elderly patient. Uh, all he was had was like fever, and the only uh, portal of entry was a skin scratch that he had while he was on vacation in Florida. and eventually he had bacteremia with staph aureus for almost 11 days um, pet ct showed uh, multiple lesions in the brain mycotic aneurysm um, splenic lesions liver lesions muscle uh, abscesses deep in inside the thigh muscles uh, and he was uh, he didn't have like a symptom to suspect any of those uh, staph aureus is like i tend to um image um staph aureus especially proslip valve endocarditis uh whole body scan 
if there is suspicion, if there is persistent bacteremia, because most of the time you find things that is not clinically evident. One question I would like to ask, can I? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, it's regarding, uh, we come across here in, in India, the certain case reports are in the stents, coronary stents, after stenting, peristent infections, abscess, leading to sometimes surgery, heals. Can you throw some light on that? Any, any data? Yeah. So, and that's not a common uh, situation that we see. Uh, you know, we see infections involving, uh, you know, uh, IVC filters, uh, but we don't see uh, the cardiac stent infections. I am not seeing uh, uh, a stent infection, um, you know, in the past 10 years that I've been here. And I, I think it's probably because the stent becomes in, you know, there is an endothelial coating. So it's kind of protected. Um, again, it's speculation. It's not something that we routinely see. No, I, I would uh, add something here, Dr. Bharat. And I think sir is right. Uh, we do see these things in India. Uh, I have seen one. And I think there have been multiple case reports from all over India. And many of, uh, a lot of it is due to reuse of hardware and improper sterilization of those, that hardware. Uh, I had one where the entire stent, the stented area had become mycotic. Uh, it was aneurysmal. The entire stent had got dislodged completely. It was a mid RCA that was stented and the stent had migrated to the distal RCA. We had to take him to surgery uh, take off the stent and then, uh, you know, ligate the RCA. So it's there. I mean, it's, uh, uh, and sometimes it can be multi-organism. I mean, and, uh, you know, I think one way back, around 10 years back, we did lose one patient uh, because of pseudomonas. And uh, another one, another organism that you need to keep in mind are atypical mycobacteria, because uh, that's also there. Uh, I think this was a report from Bombay or Mumbai, I'm sorry. Uh, where they had four atypical mycobacteria and uh, I think all of them died. Okay. And is it uh, from a reuse of a stent? Not reuse of a stent. Uh, reuse of the hardware that's used during the PCI. For I example, see. the, okay. the guide catheters, the, the, the wires, the balloons. You know, okay. the, it's not the stent. The stents are not reused, no. Right. Uh, yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I think all these organisms, uh, pseudomonas, you know, uh, non tuberculous mycobacteria, they are all con prone to contaminate the contaminants. Right. True. Uh, so, if uh, you know, if there is proper sterile technique done, uh, the stents don't get infected. But um, yeah, yeah, that's an right. interesting thing to uh, know. So, uh, you know, NTM stent infection, I imagine it's, uh, so all patients died? Majority of the patients died, Bharat. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I can't imagine how to treat those patients. Yeah. So the one I treated a couple, uh, last year, he, he survived, he went home and he's doing fair. Uh, but there was one more in my institute 10 years back who didn't survive uh, because he had pseudomonas and he had, and it had perforated and, and there was a pericardial abscess too. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, we, uh, it's very rare, no doubt. I mean, it's not like you, but it's, it's something that you really need to keep in mind when you're uh, reusing your hardware, especially be careful what your staff are doing. Okay. Because it's the staff that's, that's, that's doing the, you know, on the sterilization part. So you need to keep a watch on that. And yeah. what do you yeah. normally do? Like if a patient has stent endocarditis, for example, pseudomonas. Well, we pray, would first pray to God and send for sense. What is it is most of these things, different infections, different centers. Most of the time, as Dr. Ravi must said, a course of antibody being tried, there are few reports where the patient settled with the intense antibiotic course, uh, most of the time empiric one. Surgical approach are done. But the what I have noticed, <coughs> luckily I we haven't had, I'll tell you the reason why we haven't had. Most of the time the uh, surgical results are bad. 
when there's a stent running across the LAD or RCA gets infected after when the surgeon goes in to relieve it, naturally he's going to have some amount of coronary problem, myocardial ischemia, infarct. So the perioperative outcomes are a little bad. That is the point of concern. A lot to do with the sterility being used. We are slowly, cath lab is becoming something in between theater and the outpatient or a room. We are the uh, most of the throughout the world is, is like uh, wearing most of the regular protectivity we used to use, being avoided you slowly. Intense discussions happen with without mask and without something on cap. Time we have to reinvigorate all those uh, protective measures. That should be the answer. That's what I feel to avoid this. But maybe we can start collecting data also on that. Kupati is the, the man of uh, especially for towers is very very essential. Uh, so there is a data that says that tower done in hybrid shoes has got lesser perioperative events, including in, in infect endocarditis, as compared to tower done in cath labs. Because uh, as a as cardiologist, we we usually take less precautions as compared to cardiothoracic surgeons. So since the tower is coming as a uh, therapy where cardiologists are also equally involved, like cardiothoracic surgeon, we should also take much more precautions to prevent the prosthetic valve endocarditis involving tower. Absolutely. I think, yeah, we should take, just be like surgeons. I mean, the way they, they operate, that's how we need to treat our cat labs too. Yeah, it would be uh, like interesting to do a case series of all the stent infections. Right. Yeah, we would love to, we would love not to do that, but we <laughs> definitely need to collect the data, certainly. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to show off that data. No, no, sure. we don't want such things to happen to any of yeah. our patients, but... Uh, Sir will be able to tell us all goes with sterilization, but uh, yeah. unfortunately, India is a poor country. But but still, we can we can we avoid can. using equipment. We can definitely avoid using equipment as long as we are able to uh, have a reasonable amount of new equipments and proper sterilization. It could de it could definitely be prevented. There might be yeah, some things where it could have been could happen even with all the, all uh, taking all precautions. But having said that, ninety nine point nine nine percent. It's completely preventable provided we take proper precautions in sterilization. Okay, so, um, so. that is one interesting question, Doctor. Because has asked this question: Have you encountered polymicrobial infection in uh, uh, Yes, it is more common in uh, patients who uh, use IV drug use. So what they are shooting up may be contaminated with more than one bug, and that can uh, infect the valve. Uh, I had a patient who had uh, IV drug use endocarditis 10 years ago, and then they replaced with a prostate valve, and he was still using the IV drugs, and the second time it was multiple organisms, Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, uh, and uh, coagulase negative Staph. So it's definitely possible, and these usually involve a prostate valve, um, either uh, replaced um, for congenital heart disease, uh, and they have uh, IV as a source of entry. So it's either IV drug user or patient with hemodialysis or central line, and due to lack of sterile techniques, it gains entry into the valve. Well, Again, it's uncommon, but it definitely can happen. How common you see endocarditis in HIV patients in US? Any data we have? Uh, so it's it's not higher than patients without HIV. Uh, again, um, if uh, they are also using IV drugs, you know that might increase the uh, proportion. So HIV by itself doesn't increase the risk for endocarditis, but um, it's very common that they may also be using IV drugs. And it is also common that they are also colonized with Staph aureus or MRSA. So uh, those factors may increase the risk for endocarditis. Yeah, even here, we have seen occasionally HIV causing other involvement cardiac system but endocarditis, is, we have, we, I haven't come across in one case so far. Dr. Ravi Masar, Bhupati, Pada? R right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's really not more than the uh, general population. Uh, you're right. 
Right. And if you think about the pathogenesis of the vegetation, you know, the T cells have no role in, you know, controlling the infection. So whether the T cells are affected by HIV doesn't play. Okay. Bharat, may I ask some out of syllabus questions to you? Sure. Since you are ID specialist, we are not going. We, are, we will not. If we leave you without asking some questions related to COVID, then then we don't. We have not done justice to the current pandemic. Uh, my questions are: What is the when do you expect vaccine? Number one. Number two. What is the role of testing anti antibody for COVID? I personally feel there is no use of testing antibody for COVID because uh, as virus, we are. It's only the T cell that is going to be helpful, not the antibodies. uh could you show you i mean could you in, uh, show us the insights regarding the same uh yeah, yeah. so first question uh, about the vaccines right there are many many candidate vaccines uh, you, you know if you just look at the news it keeps coming uh, the most significant one is the uh, university of oxford vaccine uh, in collaboration with AstraZeneca that's based on a chimpanzee adenovirus and that is very promising and it would be a good news for you know india and developing world if this particular vaccine is successful um you might have heard that you know the serum institute of india you know it's the largest manufacturer for vaccines and they are building capacity um to produce these in a mass scale for the developing countries so if this vaccine is successful it's good news for india and good news for the uh, the world and uh, there are other uh, vaccines one promising is the messenger rna based vaccine it has never been tried before uh, so they just inject messenger rna that codes for the spike protein of the cor- coronavirus they coat it with a fat mo- particle and then inject and that can be easily produced in a in a short period of time uh so that's behind uh so i i believe like we will have some news by like november or december uh, it also depends on the politics uh you know uh, election is coming up and they want to show some positive news so they're trying to say it works but uh they they are hopeful that by end of this year or early 2021 we will have that unist of oxford vaccine uh then the question is about the antibodies you know testing patients with the positive antibody uh it may be helpful but it depends on why you're trying to do it uh it doesn't mean uh, if you're doing for epidemiological purposes then it makes sense but uh we don't know whether patients with positive antibodies are immune to the virus you might have heard a couple of days ago um there was a patient from hong kong who got a uh, second infection like reinfection again it's very very uncommon i don't think that will be a common scenario but a positive antibody doesn't mean that you're 100% immune you, you still can um, get it again um so antibodies you know they bind to the spike protein prevent the virus from entering into the cell so antibodies are important if we have t cell response this uh immune response will be long lasting so when you have a vaccine you you measure whether the t cell response is also there uh, because that produces long lasting uh immune response there's a, there are some few more questions that have come up um, one is the role of antibiotic envelope for redo pacemaker pocket infections okay yeah yeah so i i, I think uh, we do it in patients who are high risk for reinfection uh, the tyrex the uh, the envelope that kind of uh, releases antibiotic um, mostly rifampin in a localized fashion to the pocket uh, 
uh, that has that is promising uh, to reduce infection and high risk for getting infection again. So uh, do you also, I mean, uh, follow the protocol that you introduced rifampicin after a gap of three to five days uh, after initiating your uh, IV antibiotics, like say, I mean, vancomycin when you're dealing with MRSA? Uh, yes. So the theoretical uh, consideration is, you know, rifampin, it just takes a single or a few mutations for the bacteria to develop resistance. So if you have a very high dense bacterial colonies, uh, a few of them may develop resistance uh, to rifampin if you just give it as a monotherapy. Uh, so we give either cefazolin or vancomycin, try to kill off uh, the bacteria uh, as much as we can, and then reintroduce rifampin once we know the susceptibility and once we know that patient is most stable. Again, it's theoretical, but we do uh, defer adding rifampin for the first couple of days while we wait. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And regarding surgery, uh, which way are we going? Are we going towards early surgery or it's wait as, as much as you can? So training towards early surgery in patients who have uh, like... No, otherwise stable. Have, I mean, yeah. you're not having any of these, uh, those heart failure issues, etc. Your guy is reasonably doing well, but you know, you could embolize anytime or you could worsen any traditional indications for early okay. surgery, but otherwise. Okay, so if there is no traditional, like uh, the clear cut indication, uh, then um, no need to rush for surgery. We can stabilize, uh, even finish the antibiotic course before going for surgery. But, uh, my, my opinion, I might be wrong. For last 25 decades, the mortality, morbidity associated with in, uh, most of the cardiovascular disease we are trying to decrease. Two things that does not that, that that didn't have any significant impact. One is cardiogenic shock. The second one is infective endocarditis. You know what's your opinion about the same? Yeah, I, I think this is kind of a serious uh, condition. I think we whatever we do, I think um, it, like we can probably reduce it to twenty percent, uh, but it's it's kind of a very serious infection. Uh, even in the best of centers with the highest resource risk setting, uh, it's still very high. It has not declined. Uh, you, you're right. The paper from what Dr. Ravimath has authored is most of the patients had subacute. Even in that paper, the mortality rate is something around 25.9%, 26%. So if, if all of them are going to have acute infected endocarditis, I can't imagine how high the mortality would have been. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and a part of it was also because of delayed surgery. I mean, hardly any of them actually got surgery in that that part. But no, no, no doubt, our surgeons are getting more and more. Uh, I mean, open to the idea of operating during IE. Usually, for the surgeons, it's the previous IE case how how it went about. If it if it went about well, then they are ready to do the next case. If it had a disaster, then they'll say no, 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 wait, wait. So it's it's. On how much the surgeons are in the loop, I think that that plays a big role. Then, uh, about oral antibiotics, uh, Dr. Bharat. So you, I, I, from what I gathered from your from the poet study or from your interpretation, not a great fan of it because for India it would have been a big boon because we have strep mainly, right. and many of our patients don't want to stay in the hospital or they can't stay in the hospital for four weeks. And they would love to take it at home if, if, if that really helped out. Vimat sir, I think I would humbly disagree with your uh, idea, sir. Because, uh, we you know, in AIMS, we used to keep the patients for 14 days and send the patient with IV line so that they can admit outside and get IV antibiotics. And that kind of setup is very well established in the United States. They've got, they've got nursing care facilities available where even intubated patients can be shifted, actually. For out of hospital, in an intubated patient can be shifted or a chronic, uh, I, I forgot the name, what they used to call chronic, uh, Bharat may be able to show his insight. 
uh, desperate we can send us yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even the so such a situation can be sent outside hospital because of insurance issues. Uh, the, the hospital can't sustain. For us, for only 14 more days. Anyway, 14 days we are going to give the patient for sure in the hospital. Another 14 more days we need. We need to equip our primary care centers, secondary care centers, uh, to give this antibiotic rather than giving a oral antibiotic for this patient for, for two more weeks. And what if those patients come back with some other complications? I I personally feel our volume is. Uh, coming down with infected endocarditis, especially since I am also in private practice, I am not seeing that much amount of infected endocarditis as we used to see uh, when you, uh, we have been in training in public hospitals. I, uh, I personally feel a good primary care and secondary care setup where IV antibiotic can be continued another for another uh, two more weeks or another three more weeks, three plus three and two plus two for uh, prosthetic and uh, native endocarditis might be a viable strategy rather than completely converting into oral strategy, which we don't accept for the poet study. Nothing is there. I mean, uh, it's little difficult to believe. Maybe Murli sir may be able to. Uh, well, yeah. I, I totally agree with you, Bhupati. I'm not. I'm not a proponent of poet. I'm one of. I, I in fact um, have strong reservations for it. I was just asking uh, Bharat's opinion on it. And uh, the reason about economic thing was mainly because see, when in India, when one when the patient stays, it's not just the patient that stays in the hospital. It's his family that stays with him. So many of the time they come from far away villages. So that, that's a problem that they face. That's why they want to go home. But I'm, again, I'm not a proponent for poet, but if there's something good or positive that can be taken and taken from that study, uh, I would like to see see that. Hey, Dr. Murli, then? Yeah. yeah. Bhupati, as you said, I mean, both have got important points. In our practice, we have seen this one thing, like uh, sending the patient uh, to a smaller center. I have, we, I have done that in many patients. The issues are one is, we have to give pandal antibiotic, and IV line is a very big problem. Like, you know, the thrombophlebitis, it gets occluded. Even if you put a cava fix from the brachial line, put it in, you are going to have a limb problem. I have done in some patients, knowing well the plus and minus, have to have a good friend in another nursing home, good nursing care, jugular line. Jugular line, the single lumen or double lumen, to use it for antibiotic uh, thing. Uh, the, that is the one, one altered, but you need to develop, as you said, Friends in every center, smaller towns, but village is difficult now. But smaller towns with whom you can uh, correlate. I think COVID has given us the opportunity, the confidence to do video counseling, be with them, and all. So the future may be bright for them. One question to maybe a little late, only one question to Bharat Are you using crystalline penicillin? I have been using it. I have used it even a year ago. Simple crystalline penicillin infusion, 18 to 22 million units. That took giving a continuous infusion for 24 hours, not intermittent injection. Put it in for two uh, normal saline or uh, dextrose normal saline. It goes over 12 hours, 12 hours period. Uh, 10, 10 million like that. Are you using it in US? I uh, we if uh, uh, this bug is susceptible, you know, streptococci or even uh, enterococcus, uh, occasionally we use them. Uh, the um, it's very good. It's equally effective than. I mean, or even better than ceftriaxone or ampicillin. Uh, it all depends on, at least in the U.S., what their insurance is and uh, what will be the resources available to continue the drug as an outpatient. Uh, if the insurance company can cover the continuous pump that can give the penicillin over 24 hours, uh, then uh, sometimes we do that. It depend, if the insurance doesn't cover it, then ceftriaxone is once a day regimen and that's more convenient to give. So uh, that's the only consideration, uh, but penicillin and 24 million international units over 24 hours, it's a very good option. Do we have any more questions, Dr. Mat? Yeah, so one last, so the final question for me, uh, your empiric regimen for stable culture negative endocarditis in prosthetic valves and in native valves what what would you recommend okay culture so, negative uh, means uh, and we are talking about culture negative not 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 button not not those types the ones that you would see because our cultures are not good in, i mean we are not picking up cultures right so in in that situation again it depends on the geography right so uh, in India, if we are considering mainly streptococci, uh, 
then I'll just go with ceftriaxone for native valve endocarditis. Uh, for prostate valve, then I will go with vancomycin plus cefepime. Again, if there is a high resistant level for cefepime, then we may have to combine with the fluoroquinolone or a gentamicin. Uh, so for native valve, we are looking only for streptococci, so ceftriaxone should be adequate. For prostate valve, we are looking at MRSA and resistant gram negatives like pseudomonas. For MRSA, I would add vancomycin for covering the resistant gram negatives, either cefepime plus levaquin or cefepime plus uh, gentamicin. Thank you. Thanks for that, Lucid answer. I mean, great. Uh, so Dr. Sada, would you like to have any other questions? I think uh, today we had a very lucid lecture, actually. It's uh, in very detailed form. And especially, I'm very much uh, curious about asking about stent infection, which uh, Dr. TRM has already asked. We are not. We have to follow your registry. Probably we have to start your registry and uh, start documenting all those things. We should be providing evidence for the entire world. That that is the only point which I want to discuss, which already Dr. Mulisar has raised. Excellent lecture by Dr. Bharat. Thank you, really. Yeah, that will be great because uh, you know. Uh, uh, I, I always uh, like had that in mind. Why is the stent not getting infected? We see IVC filter getting infected. Uh, but I, I am not aware of any like series, at least in the US. So if uh, there is a case series or just a systematic review of all the case reports from India, that will be very uh, good addition to the scientific literature. I yeah, want to differentiate the, how to um, re, uh, how to differentiate between allergic uh, reaction producing and aneurysm and development in coronaries versus infective etiology. That has to be designed actually. That somebody has to take a interest on those points and have to be able to differentiate between allergic reaction versus infective reaction in development of kind of coronary aneurysm epistenting. Yeah, so that's an important point. The polymer reaction uh, and aneurysm is de uh, developing due to that and differentiating that from the infective uh, etiology. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's very difficult except pathological I, problem. I would say an, when if it is uh, aneurysm, it's infection, sir. My can't <laughs> go otherwise. There's no way the, uh, the patient will not be sick if it is only a allergic reaction. And most of these Cunio syndrome patients present with stent thrombosis rather than with aneurysm. Uh, that is the big, uh, but uh, stent, I mean, uh, I, that is the, I mean, Worst thing to have. So, so scary to see that uh, those angiograms with stent infections. In yeah. fact, it was a wonderful lecture, brother. Thank you for coming uh, very early in the morning in, from Rochester. I would uh, ask uh, the, uh, another, uh, our head of the department, who is also from Salem, uh, to conclude this with his remarks. Thank you, Bharat. It was, uh, it was a really a learning experience for all of us. Very good discussion. Thanks for enlightening us. And uh, we would like to have you at least once a year I mean, sir, this type of uh, symposium we may have to make a regular future. I love to see you more and more here uh, in Mayo, in our my webinars, and in Salem also. <laughs> nice to see my If you don't yeah. mind to be doing so well, my best wishes to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for all your um, wishing, blessings. Thank you very much. It was great to meet you all virtually. And good luck to the fellows who are in training. And uh, thanks to Dr. Bhupati for inviting me. Thanks to you, to the panel for the lively discussion. Uh, thank you all. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Ravi, sir. Thank you, Salah. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure.